World War II um, in the United States. This is the first part of a two-part um, series on World War II. In part one, we're going to be examining how World War I impacted the home front of the United States. And in part two, which is a separate recording, we'll be looking at uh, foreign policy and foreign events during the war. So we're going to start with this very iconic picture of Marines raising the flag over Iwo Jima, which we'll talk more about in part two. So let's start with the home front. So World War II is going to have an impact, of course, on ethnic groups here in America. Um, and so let's do a little comparison. In World War I, if you remember, we had talked about how um, German Americans are going to be the victims of some mob violence and discrimination because in World War I we were fighting the Germans and Woodrow Wilson launched a propaganda campaign for people to hate the Germans to gather support for the war and that kind of got out of control. Um, in World War II we're not going to see that much open hostility against German Americans. Nothing like we saw in World War I and there's some reasons for that. One reason is that there really hasn't been a lot of immigration to America for like the last 20 years. Um, previously to World War II we had the Great Depression. People aren't going to be immigrating to America during the Great Depression. There's no jobs. And before that we had the 1920s um, and we had all those immigration restrictions going on. Um, and so we see that, the, the, you know, there hasn't really been a new wave of German immigrants for 20 years. And so in that time, they've assimilated. And so it's really hard to tell who is a German American and who is not. And so they're just not obvious. Uh, next, the government doesn't really launch a lot of propaganda to get, get people to hate the Germans and want to support the war like they did in World War I. Um, you know, in World War II, the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor really kind of galvanized America, and we didn't have to have the government propaganda machine to get people to support the war. And so there isn't this kind of government-created hysteria around Germans. Now, for Japanese, it's a different story. The Japanese Americans are going to suffer greatly at home um, because of World War II, because, because of how it started. When the Japanese Empire attacked the United States on December 7, 1941, that's going to create a lot of anger and animosity and hatred to anybody who has Japanese ancestry. Um, and so we're going to see that the government is going to do various things to, um, to kind of, you know, build upon this hysteria. Um, and so what we're going to, and we'll see in a second. In addition to that, there's another reason, is that the United States has always been, uh, had, a, had a long tradition of anti-Asian um, nativism. If you remember in the 1870s um, and 80s, we had um, Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s, and there was lots of anti-Chinese immigration then. And then around Teddy Roosevelt, there was the Gentleman's Agreement to stop Japanese Americans from coming in. And so this hysteria over the bombing of Pearl Harbor just kind of re-energizes that traditional anger we have towards um, people of Asian descent in America. So we see these the development of these internment camps. So if you were a Japanese citizen in California or in the West, which is where most Japanese had immigrants had settled, um, we see that they are going to be given um, an executive order is issued by the president, and ostensibly it's said that we're going to you know corral all of these. They're American citizens, by the way, just with Japanese ancestry, and we're going to corral them up. We're going to put them on. Uh, they're going to have very little notice, and they're going to be put on these trucks, and they're going to be sent to these internment camps out in the middle of nowhere. And the government says it's to protect them from, you know, mob violence. But, you know, probably that was some of it. For the most part, though, the guard towers um, in these things that you can see in the bottom right-hand picture, you know, they were there primarily to keep people in and not keep people out. Um, and so, really, this the the public is frightened that we're going to be attacked by the Japanese again. It's not just going to end in Hawaii. They're going to attack mainland America. Um, and so, we see that, you know, with the government is like, we can't have these people among us. We're afraid they're spies. And so, these American citizens, who are Japanese Americans, are going to have their homes taken away from them, um, businesses, property, um, and put in a camp, even though they're loyal Americans, just because of how they look and their ancestry. Now, Japanese Americans are going to fight in World War II, but the government didn't want them fighting in the Pacific 
portion of the war because they thought they might be traitors or whatever. Um, and so we will see Japanese units um, fight in the European theater of the war. And they do extremely well. They win all kinds of medals and, and, and citations. Um, and, you know, this is an amazing thing if you think about it, is that a lot of these Japanese-American soldiers, they're fighting for a country um, that has put their own families in these internment camps and taken away their rights. Um, and so we we look back at this and think, wow, you know, this these Japanese, young Japanese Americans were fighting to prove to people that they deserved equality and respect um, and they, that their families did not deserve to be treated this way when their country was in need. So let's go to government propaganda. So we had said in our previous slide that the government really isn't going to launch a lot of propaganda to get people to support the war because America was attacked, so we support the war. But what we are going to have to do is we're going to have to get use propaganda to get people to do things that is going just beyond saying I support the war. Um, we're going to have to use propaganda to get people to loan the government money called buying war bonds. Um, we're going to have to get them to agree to rationing, um, you know, working outside of the home if you're a woman. And so we're going to we're going to have to get people to show their support of the war in more tangible ways than just saying they're they're in favor of it. Um, and so we do see some propaganda, but not for the same purposes as we did in World War One. World War One was just get people to support the war. Um, World War Two. We just get people, we need them to, to do things now, not just say I support the war. And so I had mentioned war bonds, and so let's look at the middle picture. So here's a piece of government propaganda, and it says, don't let that shadow touch them. So we have these innocent American children playing in their backyard, and the shadow of a swastika falls over them. And so the government is trying to use emotion, which is propaganda, to get you to, look, if you don't loan the government money, which is a war bond, we can't afford to buy the, the planks and uh, planes and tanks and guns to keep the Nazis out of America. And so by you loaning the government money, this will help America fight the Nazis. On the left-hand side, this is more of a rationing propaganda poster. It says, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Pretty scary image of an invisible Hitler. Um, and so, you know, share, if you're going to go out, share gas or share the ride so you can use less gas. And that means we have more gas um, available for the United States military. And so it's using fear, um, patriotism, um, peer pressure, all of these things to get you to do tangible things to support the war effort. So let's talk about the war effort. So World War II is an awfully big war. It's because we're going to be fighting two wars simultaneously. The United States is going to have to fight in the Pacific Theater, which is against the Japanese Empire. And at the same time, we're fighting in the European Theater. We're fighting to stop uh, the, the Germans and the Italians in Europe. And so it's really two wars going on at the same time. And America has to ramp up production to be able to fight both of these wars at the same time. And so in the, in the picture, you see FDR, and he's telling his, his advisors, he's like, go put you know, the New Deal out to pasture. We're now focused on not fixing the economy, but winning the war. Um, and so almost overnight, the Great Depression comes to an end. People are employed now. Um, in huge numbers, because either you're in the army, which means you're employed, or other branch of the military, or now you're in a factory that is producing things for the military. And so unemployment almost drops to relatively zero levels. Um, people have money in their pockets, people are happy, but now we have a new emergency and it's winning the war. So let's talk about some of this mass production. And so a good example of this is... Um, a shipbuilder, his name is Henry J. Kaiser, and he owns um, shipping yards on the west coast of the United States. And we see a picture of it here on the left. Um, and if we're going to beat these two countries, we're going to need to produce ships like nobody's business. Not just cruisers and destroyers, but also aircraft carriers and merchant marine ships to haul supplies and oil tankers. Um, all of the things a modern military needs, and we have to do it at a faster rate that we can overcome the Germans and Japanese ability to sink them. Um, we have to replace and even increase that because we're not just supplying our own needs. We're also supplying England's needs and Russia's needs, our allies. And so Henry J. Kaiser uses a huge government contract to ramp up production. So the United States government is going to give him millions and millions of dollars. And they said, look, we just want you to make these ships as fast as possible. And so he is one of these capitalists that's going to work hand in hand with the United States government to ramp up production. 
Um, before we move on, a side note about Henry J. Kaiser. He, a lot of his workforce, as we're going to find out, is women. Um, and so these women, they, as the men leave to go to war, we see we still need to make these ships. And so he hires a lot of women in his workforce. But child care is a major problem for him because the women, they're like, well, we can't come to work today because my child is sick and I have to be home and take care of my kid because obviously my husband's gone. And so he is going to pioneer some more welfare capitalism, which we had talked about in the 1920s. That's where the business decides that they will start to provide benefits to their workers to attract them to work in their company, and there's a labor shortage at this time, so he needs women to decide to come work for him. And he also wants his workers, his women, to have, be healthy and have healthy children so that they don't miss days of work. Um, and so he starts his own health company that goes alongside to help his employees. Now, after World War II is over, we'll see that it's such a successful venture that it'll eventually separate from his, um, his shipbuilding company and we'll have Kaiser Permanente. Created, And so we're starting to see some changes in um, how Americans get their health care. Next, the government creates the War Production Board. The War Production Board, simply put, its job is to get as many um, factories to stop producing consumer goods and to start making war materials. We don't need dishwashers anymore. We now need, need machine guns. We don't need cars. We need tanks. We don't need vacuum cleaners. We need, you know, other things for that. We need bullets. Um, and so the War Production Board is created to do this, and they do this through working hand in hand with big business like Kaiser. Um, and so the government is going to give out these huge, absolutely massive government contracts for lots of money to big corporations to produce as much as we possibly can. And so the war is going to help big business become successful, but thus also has a ripple effect. And of course, all of these people will be, these companies will be hiring workers. And so, like I said, this is going to end the depression rather quickly. Now, the government is going to have an increase in their authority over the economy. So here's another effect of the war, is that the government now can tell these private businesses, look, if you want our government contract, you're going to have to produce this quality when, and this amount, and you're going to have to give it for this price. And so just like we saw in World War I, we were talking about how World War I is a progressive kind of crusade. We also see that happening again in World War II, where the government is getting more and more involved in the economy because the government is becoming one of the biggest employers or sources of funding for businesses. And so the government has to ha gets to have a lot of say in how the economy runs. And so certainly not laissez-faire here. Um, we are going to have it, one of the effects of this war is that the government is going to become more and more involved in the market. Next, we have rationing. So rationing is when you limit the amount of things that consumers can purchase. Obviously, we want as much as we can to have goods go to the military in the war effort. So before we get to that, let's talk about another reason for rationing. So a little economic history here is that when a war goes on, we see inflation shoot through the roof. There's lots of causes for inflation, but in this case, it's for two reasons. One is scarcity, and the other one is government spending. So let's talk about scarcity first. And so as all of these companies start to shift from consumer production, production of consumer goods, production of war goods, there gets to be less dishwashers, less dresses, less irons, less stoves, you know, less shoes. And so more, you know, we're producing war goods, not these consumer goods I just mentioned. And so there's going to be fewer and fewer shoes and dresses and whatever available. And when there's scarcity, if I own a business, everybody wants shoes, everybody wants dresses. And so I know that I can raise my prices and people will pay it. And so scarcity causes inflation, raising in prices. The other thing that causes inflation in this case is that the government's spending. The government is putting millions and millions and millions of dollars into the economy to buy war goods. And that means that those businesses are then paying their workers. And so all of this money is getting injected into the economy. So now everybody has more money. Well, if everybody, if all of these consumers now have more money because they're employed, then as a businessman, again, if I'm selling shoes, I know everybody has more money. And so I can afford, I'm going to say, I'm going to raise my prices because everybody can afford it. And so prices are going up. Now, why is this a bad thing for the war effort? 
because you can't have out of control inflation when you're in a war. All of those factory workers that are working hard to produce war goods, they're going to get mad if they can't go to the store and get their son a new pair of shoes or their daughter a dress or buy dinner for the night because prices are going up so fast. And so we're going to have work stoppages. We're going to have strikes. Um, people are going to get angry. And so the government has to find a way to keep prices down. How do we keep inflation down? And so there's many ways to do this, right? We want to shrink the money supply because if there's less money in the economy, then prices can't go up as fast. Nobody's going to have enough money to pay those goods. So how do we shrink the money supply? So the federal government, of course, is going to raise taxes. They're going to raise taxes, one, to pay for the war effort, but there's a side benefit that if the government takes this money out of people's pockets, they're just not going to have as much to go buy goods, and if they don't have enough to go buy goods, then the people who sell shoes and dresses or whatever are going to have to lower their prices so consumers can afford it. So taxes, side benefit, is going to lower inflation. Another way is if people buy bonds, not only will that is that a loan to the government to help pay for the war, but also there's less money in people's pockets. It works just like taxes, except with bonds, you're willingly giving up the money to the government and taxes you're being forced to. Um, but the, the mechanisms of lowering prices are the same. It's, right, it's going to lower prices because there's less money in the economy. Next, the government is going to set wages. Now, this is going to be really unpopular with workers, right? But this is a way to combat inflation. If workers have less money, then there's going to be less um, raising of prices. Um, and so, the, and the government is able to do this because of propaganda. They say to the workers, "Look, do your patriotic duty. You know, after the war is over, you'll get your your wages up, and it'll be great. But you know, if you go on strike and you pr protest for more higher wages, well, that's going to be less bullets for your husband or father or brother or son in the military. You don't want them running out of bullets in the middle of a war. And so, the government is able to." tell the businesses, which are happy to do this, by the way, they're like, okay, um, we're all going to be united front here to workers. We're going to set wages at a certain level and it can't go up. And the workers, for the most part, most workers are okay with this because they think it's their patriotic duty to suffer a little bit now so that the army has the bullets they need. And then the last part of this of rationing is another way to keep inflation happening is to limit the amount of goods that is just possible for people to buy. And so the United States government is going to take, again, more control over the economy, and they're going to tell not just producers on the last slide what they can make and how much, but here on this slide, the government's getting involved in the economy to say to consumers how much you can, how much you can purchase and buy. Um, and so we see the government's going to put, issue these things called ration books. And when you wanted to go to the store to buy flour, um, you had to have the money, obviously, but you also had to have um, a sticker or a stamp. Um, from your ration book that says you you have the permission to buy it. So if you go to the store without without the stamp, it doesn't matter how much money you have, in theory, you can't buy the good. And so that's going to keep demand low, which means low prices. All of these things are working together, the government hopes, to keep inflation down. Next, labor. Um, so we had mentioned a little bit about labor on the last slide, about them not being happy that there are these wage caps on workers. Um, and so to keep workers happy and working, the government is going to create the War Labor Board. And again, their goal is to keep production going strong. Um, and so they do set limits on wages, which we said is going to be make workers angry. But the government, the War Labor Board, is going to use patriotism and propaganda and say, "Look, I know you're you want to make we want to make more wages, um, but you know we can't do it right now. The war is going on, so don't go on strike because then we don't have enough bullets for the army." And so here we see this. So the government asks unions to take no strike pledges. Um, you know, and so here we have, it says the girl he left behind is still behind him. She's a war ordinance worker, right? Um, and so here we have this woman in a factory and she's thinking, you know, should I go on strike? Um, I want more wages. Uh, I need to be able to, I want to have a better place to live for my children or I want to have food for my kids or, you know, better, whatever. But she doesn't go on strike because the government has said, look, if you go on strike, Think about your husband who's out there fighting in the war. He won't have this machine gun that you're trying to put together for him. And so we have the government encourage unions to take these no-strike pledges. 
We also back it up with a little enforcement. The Smith-Connolly Anti-Strike Act of 1943 is passed. It doesn't say that all unions can't go on strike, but it says there are certain key industries that are out there that we cannot have workers go on strike. Um, it'd be like the woman in this picture. If you work in a defense factory that makes machine guns, can't go on strike. If you work for the railroad, can't go on strike. We need to get those raw materials to factories and those finished goods to the front lines. Um, and so there were certain industries that just were not allowed to go on strike. Now let's talk about, so before we get into this, we've talked about the war and how it impacted big business, see more government control. We talked about how the war impacted labor. We talked about how the war impacted consumers. In all three of these areas, the government is getting more and more in charge of the economy in order to win the war. Let's talk about women now. So just like we've seen in almost every war in this class uh, in American history, we've talked about how when men go off to fight, women are going to move into those factory jobs or those farms or those small businesses because we have to keep the economy going while people are away fighting. And so, of course, the government uses propaganda. This is a very famous poster that's supposed to mimic the famous Rosie the Riveter, this woman who goes out and she works in a war factory and she rivets things to keep the war production going. And so here we can do it, right? And so the government is actively encouraging women to leave the cult of domesticity, to leave the home and go do your bit for the war, right? For the country. Go out and make, no, as you see in the bottom left picture, nose cones for bombers. Um, go out and make bullets in a, in, a war, in a war production factory. Go out and, you know, do what you normally men would do, but now they're away fighting, so it's your job to do this. And so we do see about 6 million women in the workforce. And of that number, about half of that is for the first time. So we see women for the first time, half of about these 6 million women leaving for the first time the cult of domesticity to go work. But the other half, these women already were working. Um, before World War II, they worked in lower paying jobs. Men had higher paying jobs. Um, and so as the men go away, the women that were already working are just going to shift up and take some of those higher paying jobs that typically we thought were men because they were dangerous or they were physical. Um, and so we see that two kinds of women are working during the war. Some women for the first time leaving the cult of domesticity and other women going from one job to another but a higher paying job that used to be dominated by men. Most of these women are going to be young um, and they're going to be unmarried because there is, I mean, it's hard as a, as a mom who is single now, well, not single, but it seems like you're single, your husband may be away fighting, and so, you know, who's there to take care of the kids? Um, and so it's very hard to do that, and so most of the women that are working are going to be young and unmarried, because they don't have this problem having to take care of kids. But the government is going to start to do some, some national health care, I'm sorry, some national daycare for women so that they can do this. So here's another expansion role of the government is the government's providing daycare for women so that they can actually go and work um, in a war industry. So the women didn't just work in factories, they also worked in the military themselves. And so we have the WAX, the Women's Auxiliary Corps, um, that's for the Army. We have the WAVES, that's kind of the women's branch of the Navy. We have the USO. These were women that were asked to go and um, support the troops' morale. And so if you are, you know, let's say you're in a port town, Los Angeles or New York, um, and there's a bunch of sailors who are about to ship out. Um, we'll go to a dance hall and, you know, dance with them. It's all chaperoned. Sing to them. Um, help the morale. That's the USO. The wax and the waves are more of a, a military branch of women. Um, and so what we'll see here is they will do jobs that will free men up in the military to go fight. And so let's say that you have a general and he's got his headquarters um, and he has all of these men who were typing orders back and forth, um, making copies, um, well, you know, men making graphing copies, um, typing up things. Um, and so those men, we think, well, they should be on the front. And so let's hire women to take those jobs to free up men to go fight. And so women, whether they're in the factories or they're in the military, um, we see them having an, a vital role um, in the war effort. We're also going to see women pilots as well. Um, when the, the planes are made in the factory, Factory, we need to get somebody to fly them to the front, and so we're going to see women pilots flying them to the front, getting near combat zones. 
So women are dreaming, they're having more and more opportunities as a result of the war. Now let's talk about the women after the war, because in every war we see, like I said, men go off to fight and women fill those roles. And then after every war, we see men come home, they want their jobs back, and so some women return to the cult of domesticity, but not all, right? About two-thirds of the women who went to work um, went um, back home. But that's a pretty still large number, that one-third. And so these women, either um, they liked working and they felt good about themselves and the income they could bring in, or that maybe their family needed the income, and so they would continue working. Um, so net, really, it's a gain from before to after the war as far as the number of women working. Um, and so we see that, you know, yes, they'll probably have to go back down to the lower paying jobs, but they're still going to stay in the workforce. Now, the government is going to launch a propaganda campaign after the war. So during the war, they're like, hey, women, we can do it. Go support your government and go work. When the war is over, they're like, okay, now what's your patriotic duty to go back home, be, uh, you know, be a stay-at-home mom, and it's your duty to make room for the men who are returning. They need jobs now. And for some women, they didn't want to do that, but they were fired and let go anyway. For other women, they did. Um, you know, there a lot of women are going to be excited about going home because during the 30s, we saw marriage rates really low because people couldn't have kids. They didn't want to have kids during the Depression. And during the early 40s, it's World War II and your husband's away. And so now, you know, you want a family. And so we're going to see that, you know, while some women didn't want to go home, other women did because they're like, okay, now let's get started and have a family. And of course, this is going to lead to the baby boom, um, where returning veterans and, and their wives after 15 years of depression and war are going to think, well, let's, you know, now the economy is better. Things are looking up. Let's have, let's have a family. So let's talk about the, the long-term impacts of women in World War II is so let's fast forward 20 years. And so when we get to the 1970s, late 60s, early 70s, we're going to see the beginnings of a women's rights movement, the modern women's rights movement, where women are demanding equality, um, opportunity, education. Um, and to some extent, you can trace that back to the Rosie the Riveter woman working in factories during World War II. Now, it's a different generation, but... Um, when women worked in factories, there's all kinds of primary documents that talk about how women um, wrote down how, for the first time, they felt like they were independent having a job. And they had people listening to them. Maybe they got promoted and they were a manager in a factory or a shift. And they felt really good about it. And then they went back home when, when the war was over and they became moms. And, um, you know, but they had an impact on their daughters because their daughters when they were young, listened to their mom's stories about how what they did in the war and how they felt good and bringing home a paycheck. And perhaps this inspired those young women when they became of age in the late 60s and early 70s to want their own uh, chance at equality. And so we see kind of this ripple effect that the daughters of Rosie the Riveter are going to ask and yearn for the things that their moms briefly experienced during World War II. Next, let's go on to migration. And so the United States is a nation on the move during World War II. Um, if you remember, during World War I, we had the Great Migration happen, where during the war, people went off to fight, and um, some African Americans saw opportunities to escape the racism and Jim Crow laws of the South and go get jobs in those northern factories for the war effort. Well, the same thing is going to happen again in World War II. We're going to have African Americans in large numbers, as you can see, leave the South and go north. But unlike World War I, in World War II, we're also going to see a lot, a lot bigger migration west by African Americans. And so, yes, we're going to see African Americans continue to move to cities like Detroit and New York and Chicago. But we're also going to see African Americans start to move west to Denver, to San Diego, to Los Angeles. Um, these cities are going to grow quite a bit. Um, not just because African-American um, migrants are moving there, but also people off of farms looking for jobs in cities, but also people moving around the United States looking for either work in, in factories that are war-related or military bases that are war-related. And so we're going to see that the West is going to be, so this is how it's different than World War I, the West is also added to this fast growth of migration. And we get to see something called the Sun Belt at this time. So the Sun Belt is going to go from San Diego and Los Angeles, and then east across the lower part of the United States into the South. 
South. And so, yes, we see people moving out of the South, but we're also going to see, unlike in the first Great Migration, people moving into the South. Because the government's going to open up a whole bunch of military bases in the South and the West. Um, it's got good weather, so you can train troops all year long. Um, it's pretty rural, and so their land is cheap, and so the government can open up these huge um, training bases. And so we're going to see that the South and the West are going to benefit um, much more in some regards the North is because of this migration during World War II as the military is going to be opening up bases. So it's not just you know factories that are opening up jobs, but also the military is going to be opening up jobs. And people are on the move looking for these new places to go, especially as what we said, the Sun Belt. Now let's talk about African Americans. We did talk about them a little bit on the last slide. But as we continue to have another great migration out of the South into the North and the West, um, now we see that that's going to be a pull factor pulling African Americans out of the South. Um, a push factor is that there's going to be a new machine invented. It's called the mechanical cotton picker. Um, and this is going to replace lots of sharecroppers in the South. So if I am a white man who owns a plantation or a large uh, um, cotton farm in the South, I don't need sharecroppers anymore because I don't need them to pick the cotton and I have this machine to do it. And so I can tell most of the African Americans who have been sharecropping my land for a long time, get out. Um, I have this machine that I don't have to support. I just, you know, it, it, it helps me get things done more efficiently. And so that's going to be something pushing African African Americans out of the South looking for jobs in the North and the West, as well as the pull factor of these factory jobs. Here we see a picture of uh, African American women who are Rosie the Riveters um, also getting jobs in the North. Now, obviously, another push factor of uh, pushing African Americans to leave the South is just like what we said in the Great Migration. We have Jim Crow laws still going on, racism, those kinds of things. And just like in World War I, as African Americans move north or African Americans move west into Los Angeles or San Diego, we're going to see um, race riots result. As Western and Northern communities continue to get African Americans, some of the white people in those communities are not going to like the way their neighborhood is changing. And so we're going to see, just we see in this picture on the bottom right hand corner, a disturbing picture of white mobs pulling African Americans out of stores, off of you know, out of their apartments, off of, in this case, a, a bus, um, and beating them up. And this is some of this, here's another result of World War II. It's this um, increased racial animosity as as America goes through these changes. So then we have A. Philip Randolph. So he is an African-American leader in the 1930s and 40s, and he looks around, and, and part of him is happy that African-Americans are getting better jobs. African-Americans are working in some of these war industries, and that pays a lot more um, working in these factories than they did picking cotton in the South. But having said that, they're still the last hired, first fired in any factory. Um, white people get preference. And also, they make less than white people on average. And he says this is not right. We are coming to the need of our country. Um, our country says we need more machine guns, we need more tanks, we need more jeeps, whatever. And so we are providing those things. We are being patriotic. We're coming to factories, but you're treating us as second-class citizens by not keeping us employed as much as white people and pay, paying us less. And so he says this has to stop. And so he is organizing a march on Washington to let the country know, a symbolic march on Washington to say, hey, America is being hypocritical here. FDR had said that in his Atlantic Charter that America is fighting World War II to spread democracy and freedom and liberty to the world. But we can't do that at the same time that we're treating African Americans here at home as second class citizens. That's hypocrisy. And so that's the goal of his march on Washington to point this out. Well, this was really embarrassing for FDR. He can't, I mean, it makes him it makes him look like a hypocrite. He can't say to the world that America's the good guy and we're fighting for freedom, democracy, and liberty. We have African Americans protesting and marching during a war to point this hypocrisy out. And so through through his people, he contacts A. Philip Randolph and they work out a deal. Um, so to keep the march from happening, the Fair Employment Practices Commission is created. This commission is a federal commission 
and it is designed to keep discrimination from happening in businesses. And so in companies that accept federal money, which are all the big corporations in America, whether it's General Motors or Ford or Chrysler or Lockheed Martin or any of these companies that are producing for the war effort, they say, look, if you want a government contract and make lots of money making Jeeps and tanks and aircraft, whatever we need for this war, there's a string attached. You cannot discriminate on your hiring and firing um, based on race. And we have a commission that's going to be set up to make sure you don't do that. So if I'm an African American and I think that I didn't get a promotion, I'm not getting equal pay, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting fired when another white person isn't, I think it's race-based, that I can go to this commission and report to them and they will investigate. And the company will listen because they don't want to have their big, nice government contract to produce tanks or whatever it is to be withdrawn. And so here we see some real gains for African Americans as a result of World War II. Now let's talk about the impact of the war on the economy. Of course, this is a very expensive war. Um, and as we can see here in billions of dollars, um, the United States is going to go into debt. That's what this is showing, the United States government debt in the 1930s because of the New Deal. But then we really see it ramp up in the 1940s, that we exponential change in the amount of debt that the United States has. And that's because we have to you know, we have to borrow for this war. Yes, we're going to increase taxes for the war, but that's nowhere near enough to pay for all of the tanks and bombs and planes that we're producing. And so the United States is going to go heavy into debt and to, excuse me, to borrow to pay for this war. All right. So, so that's going to be a result of the war, more debt. But also some good news that the economy is going to expand, especially from the Great Depression. As we had said earlier, unemployment almost zeroes out to, to really relative nothing. Um, everybody who wants to have a job for the most part can get a job because you can join the military, you can be in any of these war industries, factories you're hiring. Um, and so we see that um, America's economy is humming along. And it's not just us, right? We have to also produce for our allies, the British and the Russians. And so we have to provide what FDR called the arsenal for democracy, right? We have to provide for the entire allies that are trying to fight our enemies. And so uh, America just has they have more work than we, than we can fulfill. And so we're just, the economy does really well in the 1940s as a result of the war. Now let's kind of fast forward a little bit when we think about the end of the war. Yes, at the end of the war, there is going to be a, a, sharp, a sharp downturn as factories have to close down when the war is over. The government's not buying tanks anymore, and they have to retool, change their assembly lines to make instead of tanks to go back to making cars, instead of making you know machine guns to go back to making sewing machines. And so there will be a bit of a post-war drop-off in 1946 and 47, but then when we get to 1940. 48, America's economy is going to go rip-roaring fast again is because we are untouched by the war. Um, we did not have our cities bombed by by German bombers or Japanese bombers. Um, and so we had the oceans to protect us from our homeland being attacked for the most part, um, the mainland being attacked for the most part. And so we come become really uh, relatively untouched by the war. Now our, all of our competitors around the world, be they Germany or Russia or England or Japan, well, their economies are totally devastated because their countries have been destroyed. They were in the combat zones. And so we're going to see this from about 1948. The United States economy is going to rebound quickly from that post-war slump and just go back to where it was and even go higher than it was during World War II. And so the war is going to have a really good long-term impact on the economy. For about 15 years after World War II is over, the U.S. economy is going to be at its all-time high as far as dominating the world for production. So now let's go to 10. And so I've, I've made this point, but I want to just come back to it, is that the war does have an impact on the government. The government is going to get bigger and more powerful and more part of people's lives as a result of World War II, right? The government, as we had said, is going to tell consumers what they can and can't purchase through rationing. The government is going to control private businesses. These big, huge corporations are going to listen to the government and do what they say because the government is handing out the money. Um, and so the government tells con uh, businesses what they can produce and how much. 
Um, next, we're going to see that the government, because of the reforms of the New Deal, is just going to continue to re continue some of those New Deal programs like the Securities and Exchange Commission. And so throughout FDR's term, whether it was his efforts to deal with the, new, with the, the Depression and have the government get bigger because of the New Deal, and then it slides right into World War II, an indelible change in America in these 20 years of the 30s and the 40s is the government is going to become really big and powerful and a part of people's lives, much more than it has ever been in American history. And that just that hasn't changed to this day. As I sit here and give this lecture in 2020, the United States government has a huge role to play in the United States economy um, with their regulations and their, their spending. Um, and so we see that this is going to fundamentally change the uh, how the government deals with the economy moving forward. We also talked about employment regula regulations in the, in the, so this just review from the Great Depression. All right, um, we also talked about the government's impact on business. And so having made that point, Really, let me just kind of sum up what part one of this lecture was about. It was about all the ways that World War II changed America here at home, whether it's African Americans or women or the role of government. All of these things are changing um, as a result of World War II. And this is something that is going to be key concepts in this class is that, you know, wars are important because if they, they're a catalyst for change in American history. They speed things up really quickly. Um, and so this is something that you should be prepared to think about as we move forward. Next up will be part two of the lecture, and that's going to be on actually fighting itself, the Pacific theater and the European theater and the end of the war. So that's it for our lecture today. That's it for part one.